Hello everyone, time for the Q&A and here is Bismarck from Military Aviation History. Hello. He will help me out by reading out the questions and providing some support if necessary. <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> right, so Andrew wants to know, um, you've talked at length about how the sources strongly disagree about the impact of land lease on the Soviet war effort. What, in your personal opinion, is probably true about land lease and its impact? So basically, from what I read, the most two extreme positions are that from David Glantz that noted it would have just taken longer for the Soviets. And the other is um, the Russian historian Sokolov, uh, who basically said, I think the other way, like the Soviets would not be able to have won the war at all or even lost. Now, the issue with Sokolov is, should I add here, a lot of people in Russia see him extremely negative. Um, there are also some other issues which I encountered to a certain degree. So, yeah, but there's also some troubles with Glantz sometimes. But he's generally not as controversial. But then again, I think, yeah, it's hard. So, basically, then there's other issues as well. Like, a lot of historians actually note that the land lease trucks were the most important and they were key for the Soviet major operational victories in the late war stage. Problem is, one of the foremost experts on Soviet logistics nowadays, H.G.W. Uh, Davy, in his two papers, at least, and I think there's a third coming, notes, at least in one paper, that the land lease trucks were not that important. And he was published by the journal on Slavic War Studies or Slavic how Slavic Military Journal. Yeah, Slavic yeah. Military. Yeah, I always get this wrong. Which is was published once or who was the editor once was Glantz and now it's uh, Alexander Hill. Also in his book about Cambridge History of the Second World of the Red Army noted the thing with the land lease trucks, if I remember correctly. Something actually I pointed out in my 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 Soviet logistics video. So I and I'm I'm on the fence on this. So I'm, I assume, so basically the thing was from, I, I see certain themes or patterns usually. I first realized this in my Taranto video. There was a paper written on the Taranto, which was the main source. And it basically stated Taranto, so the, the attack of the British so, uh, swordfish bombers on the um, naval base of the Italians where they sank at least one battleship or damaged heavily. And this was always portrayed as a major strategic victory. And he argued in this article, I think, there was basically only a tactical victory or at most an operational one. So he went completely the other way. And for me, I see this pattern more or less that you have one, one interpretation for a long time. And it gets ingrained. And then somebody disagrees with it. But he or she doesn't go like 100% he goes to 150 or 180. It's like extremely. And then over time, usually it's more or less somewhere in the middle. Yeah. We have, for instance, the same with, with uh, for a long time, it was not necessarily professional historians, I think, but for a long time it was like the Germans almost won the second war. If you look nowadays, a lot is basically written the Germans could have never won at all. And you see this, this tendency. And, and here, I think, is the thing with land lease tracks were so important. And then it should be David looks at this and says, eh, well, no, I disagree. Because he figured out that the Soviets figured problems out that there were already a problem in the 19th century. Because here you have these different forces for logistics over space, time, and, and all elements. And he figured out, okay, they made it work with other elements as well. And so I think he has a very good point. So I think land lease tracks were probably overemphasized, but I think he underemphasizes them as well. So it's just, this was just a name of your blood. So we're not even land lease here. <laughs> so we just did the trucks. So the other thing is if with, with land lease, like if you start an alternate history scenario, you, you need to ask you several questions. Um, if the Soviets don't get land lease, what happens if it? 
do the Americans give all the stuff to the Brazilians, the French, the free French, yeah. the free French. They put it, they raise more divisions. They like they, because they don't have less industrial output, so they have more manpower. They could, or they equip their divisions with more stuff to give even more to the British because the majority of land is as far as I remember went back to the British. Um, nobody uses it, mm, and there was also a lot of resources skipped. So it's not uh, it's it's you land lease was radios, it was food, it was I think sometimes even raw food like wheat. It was high octane fuel that the Soviets then mixed up with their octane fuel, so that they had some mid octane fuel and uh, aluminium, aluminium, uh, a lot of um, gunpowder or, or nitrate or some stuff you needed for gunpowder. I don't know exactly if they supply gunpowder or something else, but there's a lot of going on. So many factors. So what were a lot of the benefits of of land lease? You have strategic. Focus on production. Salts plus tanks, simply said, and US produce radius. Just take two extreme samples. Because so tanks were really good, sometimes not as good as some proclaimed, and also they changed over time. And the Western allies usually had better um, electronic industry, and I think also chemical industry. What you get from this, you get efficiency bonuses. Because the longer you produce certain stuff, usually the better you get. You have like this with the 109, I think, as yeah. well. So it took way long in the beginning of the war and in the end of the war to produce the 109. And they also, each side produced the best equipment possible. So US radios, from what I know, were by far the best, at least compared to Soviet ones, I think. And even they were better than German ones, for most part. So you have like here a multiplier in on, on several levels. Then you have higher quality resources to a certain degree provided. Also food for the front sometimes is pointed out this was very important because they provide canned food on a high quality. And, and in the field you need, if you, especially if you're doing attack or in, um, prolonged fighting, you need a lot of calories. Yeah. And you need to provide this in a proper form to bring it to the front lines. Then ammo for the front, as mentioned already, chemical industry. And these effects stack. So you have a bit of better radios, you get like, you say, one or two percent bonus. You have a bit of better food, you get a one or two percent bonus. You, you can produce suddenly like five percent more tanks because you only focus on tanks. It adds up. So you have a more or less of a cascading effect. And at the same time, since the swords can put more pressure and have less delay, let's say, to various issues. For the German, it's the other way around. So the Soviet offensives run less fast out of steam and the Germans have less time to catch their breath, which prolongs the whole situation and increases the wear and tear, or doesn't increase the wear, or less, or actually the other way, yeah, it increases the wear and tear on the Germans, but less so on the Soviet side. And we all know that the Western allies and even the Soviets ran into manpower issues in 1944 and 45 in particular. So the longer the war takes on, the more war down every side gets. And the longer the, the thing goes, I mean, this was the same for the Germans originally. In Barbarossa, they wore down over time. The longer lines of, of communications and everything. So, and one, one, point that was raised by Mark Harrison, economic historian, I think he's now emeritus. Um, he actually noted that in basically every war, the losing side, the economy collapsed. And I think one determining factor is that at one point, people stop caring for the system and they just go completely self-survival. And they drop down everything and just steal and, and run. This is one element. And he argues, we don't know how close the Soviet economy was to collapse. But land lease certainly helped to that the collapse was farther away. We don't know if it happened, but it could have happened. 
because in 1941 it was pretty dire situation and 1942 also was if you I mean the order from from Stalin no 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 step back and everything of course they're all controversial there they were not completely because he just was angry or something there were certain reasons for this and then again land lease doesn't really come into its own until 1942, 1943, and so on. I mean, there yeah, is. Well, you, they, have, the, you have the psychological. Of you course. get already already yeah. in 1941. You get already stuff, yeah. and so yeah, it's it's hard hard German. Mm. My verdict is thus: it definitely shortened the war, mm. and would no land lease at all would the, I mean no land lease for the Soviet Union if no land lease at all so even not the British well if only if, if the Soviets didn't get land lease it could have led to a stalemate I don't think the Germans could have won in that sense of course leaving out psychological issues because psychological issues sometimes there were battles that were actually basically one by one side and then this psychological problem happens or something and everything goes down the drain. So for most part leaving that out, it's yeah, could have, you could have that that you ran into a stalemate or something. I mean you should not forget in 1941 and even 1942 the Germans at some point seemed unstoppable and those are the Japanese at point. And this makes it rather hard in many aspects. Yeah, I mean, from the air side, maybe if we also talk about land lease, initially, like in 1941, there was very little sent. Uh, what was sent was, well, even the Soviets realized that performance-wise, you know, when they got hurricanes or something like this from the, from Britain, these were hand-me-downs. They weren't really, well, hurricanes were all right, but some of the other planes that were sent throughout land lease uh, weren't really suited to the Russian theater of war, which is another issue, of course, if you get sent material that you then cannot use, probably Spitfires were one of those things. Um, and then later on, of course, you do run into a situation where certain aircraft were very well liked by the Soviets and where we know from the soldiers and from, from the Soviet Air Force that, hey, this was good stuff. They don't necessarily talk about it that much, especially in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when the Cold War is sort of really getting not that cold. Um, but sort of what you get recently from the from the Russian historians is generally speaking, again, you already mentioned this, there's a little bit of a divide also in the, the Russian academic circles about what the effect of land lead was. But I think on the air strip, you know, it, it did help to give them a certain amount of planes which then helped them also to rebuild and restock their own sort of industry because Operation Barbarossa gets as close as anybody has essentially been, except for the Luftwaffe in 1945 when it commits death uh, via Bodenplatte, um, of comprehensively destroying an air force. I think that's the closest any air force has gotten to comprehensively destroying any other air force at any point in time, except if we maybe look at the Six Day War in, uh, with Israel um, because that is essentially a textbook um, case there. So being able to send a couple of plans and then also at the same time being able to rebuild your industry with aircraft and getting the things going and restocking your, your strength does help. Even if you only get sent 100 or 200 planes, that allows you in a limited time and space to hold the line, uh, get people in the air and don't give the Germans complete reign over, over um, the, you know, the, the skies of Russia. Uh, even though the Germans do have temporary air superiority for a long time. Um, but yeah, that gets very complicated in that case again. Yeah, so, and also you see the Germans, they are seeing the, the American and British equipment on the Soviet yes. side as well. So there's also a psychologically negative effect on the Germans to a certain degree because they see, well, we are really fighting the world at this point. Yeah. I mean, there is this, this, uh, this again, it's a memoir, so you have to be a little bit careful, but there is this one... Um, anecdote, let's call it, where the Germans run into uh, Spitfires in, at Kuban for the first time and they sort of hush it down because they say like, oh, don't tell the pilots or everybody else that you have seen Spitfires or have been fighting Spitfires because this is just going to destroy everybody's morale again because people are going to have a memory of the Battle of Britain. Again, I don't know how much accurate that is. Uh, I mentioned most people, people, most pilots that actually flew during the Battle of Britain were not anymore around in 1943. So the memory there would have been anecdotal at best uh, and also that actually is an interesting point because the Soviets didn't like the Spitfire so 
the Germans get, you know, apparently get scared by it, but the Soviet pilots actually have to fly these machines. Um, the Mark Fives that they got, the Mark Nines, they appreciated those a little bit more. Um, you know, they weren't happy with those. So yeah, we can go into morale and of course fighting the whole war, but I think we've chewed through this question quite, yeah. quite nicely. Um, so yeah, thanks Andrew for sending in your question and uh, for supporting um, Bernard's channel and also my channel. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting. Thanks. And thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.